Well, hello, that's me again. Today is September 27th. It is Friday. I was supposed to make a video actually yesterday, but of course, uh, lovely IT departments of all kinds of the corporations, they decide for some reason to do some updates. They move one button from the other place and think that, oh yeah, that increased, you know, functionality. Of course, it didn't. It just kills their already setup, which people get used to and works and works beautifully. Well, guess what? They screw it up for me yesterday big time and I'm not gonna tell you what kind of software before that for two and a half years it worked just fine for me uh, come to think about it yeah it's more than probably than two and now we have this situation and I'm not even sure that I will get uh, everything you know edited properly however what you saw in the beginning the video is the video of the uh, chas of yar uh, and uh, well, it's uh, not a very good video for those people who are, you know, have been in the range of the, uh, you know, effect of this explosion, which was Fab 3000. But if you see this whole video, uh, you can find it on the internet and all kinds of the TG channels and what have you, uh, you will see yourself that actually after this FAP 3000, which is a monster of a bomb, there were three FAP 1500s which flew in and basically leveled already leveled place. And this actually signifies the fate of the armed forces of Ukraine. Well, well the fate which um, Mr. Zelensky visited... <laughs> Washington DC and selling absolute garbage under the, the title of the victory plan which is not really victory plan as uh, very many people stated correctly is the wish list of what he wants to get it's not gonna work obviously and we without any procrastination let's take a look immediately at the uh, 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 armed forces of Ukraine losses. It was day before yesterday. It was the 25th of September. But uh, but as you can see yourself, it is consistently above 2,000, and it's uh, 2,390. Pardon me. Um, of personnel uh, written off the order of battle in reality even more probably twice more so you have the tanks uh, which are five IP ipcs 31 37 of artillery and four mlrs heimers and other types of mlrs's are having a hell of a time i mean a really bad time in uh, ukraine primarily in kursk and uh this is uh, uh what we have to take a look now at the situation with kursk let me show you it's also 25th uh day before yesterday but i mean a change uh, but uh, somewhat but as you can see yourself uh i showed you a few videos ago the uh you know the one of the cauldron to the north which was forming now you have a larger cauldron forming uh to the south and that pretty much plugs in the whole uh kursk uh, adventurism so to speak a uh, so-called operation by all those you know oh yeah you know, Ukrainian armed forces and all those native people and um, yeah they can still uh, could or can get a little bit in a uh, very few are getting out alive and as you saw yourself the intensity will only increase and uh, of course the um, uh, Ukrainian cities uh, are being uh, bombarded non-stop and this is a really really serious problem of course uh, for uh, many people who for some reason believe that something is going to change you know in terms of the dynamics of the uh, 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 front but of course it's actually we are observing make sure that you understand this that we are witnessing the collapse of the front and again as our good friend Marat Hyrulin, Hyrulin shows us what is happening on uh, at Ugledar Russians are already inside Ugledar about 40% of Glidar is under Russian control, probably more by now. The roads, both roads which led out of Glidar are completely blocked. And that's another cauldron, apart from the Nevelskoye cauldron. And those remaining armed forces of Ukraine troops have been begging to let them get out, you know. But no, no order came uh, to those people. And so yeah now their fate is literally sealed and Uglidar is just one of many um, um, basically uh, points or towns or what have you um, which villages which has been liberated by Russian or is about to be liberated by Russians so uh, pardon me needed to uh, 
needed to sneeze. So, and um, as the result, what, what can I say? We have the uh, very interesting situation uh, with the whole front line and many people in Washington are really not happy. And I don't know why, uh, how to, you know what, sometimes you are lost for the words, you know, you really do not know what else uh, could be done about all that other than sit there and observe in horror, actually, of what is happening. But if life goes on, as you know, Mr. Zelensky met Mr. Trump, it was for 15 minutes, people say, but I don't care. I mean, Zelensky curse, you know, that don't, uh, you know, shake the hand of this guy. So uh, many people who shook it, well, yeah, it's over for them, politically at least, and for some probably physically. So yeah, Trump shouldn't have done that. But yes, I'm pretty sure that many people, especially MAGA crowd, I understand their aspirations, believe me. As I already stated, I do not make secrets of, of, you know, that I'm going to go and vote for Trump. But MAGA crowd probably who accept him uncritically, uh, they don't understand that the fact that he... Uh, met Zelensky for 15 minutes and told him just go screw yourself and we're not gonna provide anything and we need to settle and close this uh, you know close uh, this whole situation and end this war uh, it's not gonna work you have to keep in mind uh, Trump as many people still do not understand he is part of the system and while he has some kind of the common sense and aspirations uh, policy wise it's not gonna change that is why Mr. Lavrov is on record saying very openly that those people don't understand anything but, you know, complete military victory and, you know, this uh, combined West doesn't understand anything but force. Or speaking, as I always quote him, uh, Al Capone's famous uh, expression that with the gun and kind word you can get much further than with the kind word alone. And this is exactly the case. They do not understand most of it. But, of course, everybody thinks that I need to go out and give now some explanations to the, what is the update of the nuclear doctrine of Russia, which happened, I mean, this week. So, what can I say? Let's go, let's not procrastinate and go to our comrade Madura. Of course, he's not comrade Madula. Madura. Madura is his uh, call sign, uh, basically, and handle. But this is Alexey Lyankov, Colonel, and... Uh, retired and he is talking in this case it's a, a little bit uh, confusing why he's talking about the concept of american prompt global strike because america doesn't have uh capabilities to do that because it doesn't have a real serious uh you know hypersonic weapons well it doesn't have any hypersonic weapons the only weapons which united states can launch are actually intercontinental ballistic missiles with the MIRVs, you know uh, multiple independent re-entry vehicles that's about it it doesn't have hypersonic weapons of course, they were trying to stick something since whatever 2004 when this stupid concept <laughs> came up. But but and they wanted to use the um, ballistic missiles, and then Russia said, you know what? We don't care what you use. We will treat it uh, not as some kind, you know, single prompt global strike attack on some kind of the Afghan uh, terrorism, you know, uh, hideout. We're gonna view it as the uh, nuclear attack on Russia, and we will respond uh, uh, accordingly. Uh, poor uh, souls at that time in 2004, 2003, when this whole concept was birthed in the deep recesses of the fantasistas in Pentagon and military industrial complex they didn't know that they will fall behind dramatically by generation in developing well it's not even generation it's uh, they simply don't have hypersonic weapons why russia uses them <laughs> deploys them in the front line service from strategic uh, uh, type weapons to uh, obviously tactical operational and here we have the situation that alexey Lyankov speaks about the, the update of the nuclear doctrine was a response to new realities which i agree completely and this is what he explains to some people who may not understand the implications the updated doctrine among other things um, among other things is for example having now belarus completely under russian nuclear umbrella viewing belarus obviously as a full part of not russia but unified state and uh, any attack on uh, belarus will be treated absolutely the same way as attack on russia and so any massive attack on our territory will now be considered an attack with all the ensuing 
in consequences. Previously, it was assumed that the response would be only to for those countries from where the missiles or other nuclear carriers were launched. Now, the possible potential response is extends to those who launch the missiles and those who supply them. Such an answer had to be doctrinally fixed, and it was fixed. Uh, Russians were talking about it for a long time, since practically start of the special military operation, and now it is enshrined in writing in Russian military doctrine. And as you can see yourself, uh, Lyankov was uh, speaking to Russia's uh, establishment, uh, Russia's Gazeta. It's kind of like uh, Frankenstein creation between Washington Post and New, New York Times uh, equivalent in Russia. So it's very important what he says there. And so he talks about, first of all, the president made it clear that the conflict in Ukraine will affect not only the Kiev regime, all voluntarily assist, voluntary assistance on the Kiev regime are also uh, uh, assistance are also under attack. For example, if a massive launch of French cruise missiles was carried out on our territory, or rather against our territory, the response will go to French military facilities. If British, then to British, and so on. And so on, of course, is to, about American uh, mainland, not just bases on the, you know, in Europe or uh, Middle East. That's easy. The Russians have them long time in their, you know, crosshair and have more than enough uh, weapons and the weight of the salvo to turn those places into desert. And, of course, you know, leaving those people who will come up with this idea idea to attack Russia, if, if, you know, if it is uh, nuclear or it is conventional. Well, that's, um, uh, you know, ambiguity. You want to have this ambiguity. So, and what is most important, he says, it will no longer matter whether the launch was carried out on the historical territory of Russia or on our new territories. These games are already over. Any massive attack will have consequences. Well, that's pretty much straightforward. Obviously, uh, Many people, well, I keep in mind, I wrote about it for the second decade now I'm writing about it. It's not just the fact that Russians necessarily will have the, to, uh, you know, uh, response immediately with a nuclear weapon. It's um, no, not quite like that. Uh, as I already showed, these things which are coming now as the hot pancakes from their Denny's kitchen, uh, you have to keep in mind, they are, they are carriers of the P-800 Onyx, well, the new uh, iteration of Onyx has the, uh, and this is two and a half, uh, Mach two and a half, but between Mach 2.5 to 2.9, depending on the circumstances, and calibers, uh, as a matter of fact, too. So, uh, it, they also the Zircon carriers, and that means that uh, United States territory, if United States decides to commit suicide, uh, Russians have the escalation dominance, not just in the quality of the weapons, which it is absolutely, un they are uncontested. United States simply has nothing like this. But, but what they have is that this escalation dominance from the point of view of the staging until, uh, you know, what, escalating towards the nuclear threshold. United States can say that it will respond in terms of nuclear uh, weapons, but as I already stated, uh, for example, couple of those wonderfully looking uh, submarines of the Project 885 Yasin class, armed with zircons, out of 32 they carry, they can carry probably 15 of zircons, you know, whatever the other uh, they will be carrying is the whole other story, but they can attack pretty much any crucial uh, military installation on the territory of the United States proper, in the obviously coastal areas, and they do not necessarily have to be nuclear for start. Of course, they may become nuclear if people don't get the message, but of course, for starters, Russians will likely uh, to demonstrate if things will continue the same way. Uh, they will continue to do it, you know, in a uh, very direct way against the real installations of, for example, yeah, their, their, pos their possibility to, you know, sink a frigate or two of the uh, Marine Nationale, which is the uh, Navy of the France, or, uh, you know, just turn the, uh, let's say, Acrority Air Base on Crete of the Royal Air Force into the parking lot. Yeah, that's not a problem. Russians are within five minutes, really, of executing this type of things. There are plenty of hypersonic weapons there, which will cover distances of 2,000 kilometers and really, really fast. Uh, more like in five minutes of six, 
probably depending on the circumstances so and this is uh, the thing which uh, people have to understand and this was the idea and it evidently worked uh, behind this whole uh, situation with Ukraine when Russians are finishing off the remnants uh, those troops are highly on uh, I mean uh, of Ukrainian troops are highly untrained they are not very good fighting qualities. They are really good at sitting out in the trenches and in the dugouts. But even there, as you saw yourself in the beginning, uh, that is a really, really bad situation when you have FOB 3000 flying into your building. Or rather, uh, the whole, you know, uh, you know uh, uh, city uh, uh, I don't know, it's probably what, Ugledar, if you take a look at Ugledar, uh, Ugledar is not very large, really. I mean, there are several city blocks, but yeah, FOP 3000, yeah, it can basically deal with the whole city block, and that will be it, and you're going to be buried and killed or what have you. So, and this is uh, not just that. Now we have, uh, so we know that Mr. Zelensky uh, obviously visited uh, Washington, but here we have that uh, business insider, you know, about talking about that, well, you know, United States will provide the JSOL to um, Ukrainians. So, well, what can I say? Obviously, Business Insider, it, it's tabloid. They don't understand the first thing about military, but and whatever this Jake Epstein guy, he needs to, you know what, uh, start writing this in the all kinds of the pathos reading terms, but say Ukraine is getting powerful long-range glide bombs from the U.S. that will give its F-16 a new punch. Obviously, it's complete garbage because, first, they are not long-range. The longest range the JSOL can fly is about 120 kilometers if it is launched from about the elevation of 12 uh, kilometers 12,000 meters yeah this is not a good idea because with its very limited range it means it will immediately enter the well air defense zone of Russian air defense and uh, uh, so in order for them to launch and hit something they literally need to enter air defense and become very easy target if they launch it from the elevation slower than 12,000 meters, let's say two, three kilometers, the range decreases dramatically for JSO and it can fly probably, well, 25, 30 kilometers max. And yeah, this is an easy target for Russian air defense. And actually, uh, you know what, if you read this Business Insider thing, uh, you will recognize that if you scroll down the article, uh, yeah, he kind of mentions it that yeah, in reality, it's not that good. But you know what? You need to sell all this hype and all this, you know, the encourage, you know, uh, people in the West to think that United States produces the best things, you know, and they are, you know, never have been better, uh, which is complete garbage, of course. We know this. And they try to run those tests in the combat conditions. But the problem is uh, none of them will be able to be updated to such a degree that to still face the capabilities of the, which also increase and increase exponentially of the Russian military, branching from air defense to, uh, you know, early warning to ISR and what have you, not to speak about, uh, you know, the firepower, which was always overwhelming. Now it is precision and uh, firepower. And in terms of long range fires, no matter what United States do, it uh, does, it's already uh, out of the contention, the uh, competition, because essentially, what 3M 14M new uh, caliber missile with a range of four and a half thousand kilometers, XBD, which is the range of eight thousand kilometers. These are cruise missiles. United States is not even touching this. You know, in not even vicinity of the ranges. The only the long range they have now is the good old uh, Tomahawks with uh, you know uh, the maximum range is two and a half thousand kilometers, and that's it. So it doesn't, uh, you know, compare really favorably to what the Russians already deployed and are using. And the next generation of weapons which are coming in Russia, they will be simply fantastic. Some people do have, I mean, there was a very famous joke a few years back when Vladimir Zhirinovsky was still alive. He was screaming at something, as he usually did, uh, at the uh, Tribune, uh, uh, a pedestal somewhere in the studio, and said, yeah, look, we have S-700 coming out. He might have been joking, but again, uh, 
who knows uh, s550 is already in the serial production so you can expect uh, all kinds of uh, stuff from those damn ruskies and then there is uh, this uh, situation which is really really uh, strange so to speak and as much as i detest the uh, western media and as you can see yourself I don't know his uh, proper name, pronunciation, Craig Mohiber or Mohiber. Uh, he talks about uh, the, how Western media can be prosecuted for its role in Gaza genocide. I agree. Most of the Western corporate medias are war criminals. They are Gebelsonian. There's no difference between them. And so uh, when he talks about not just Gaza genocide or, you know, the crimes which uh, IDF will be committing and is committing in Lebanon, don't forget there is Ukraine. Ukraine, it was all about State Department and those people in Pentagon, uh, incompetent as they are, and that started this whole situation, starting from uh, the cabal of Neocons and Victoria Nuland. And those media supported it completely. They put them, you know, all their way. Those New York Times, Washington Post, and, you know, Chicago Tribunes, and BBCs, and ABCs, and what have you. From London to Washington to Berlin, they threw their weight behind this, what is now a catastrophic situation for Ukraine, with more than a million killed. It's, believe me, when the real number will be uh, presented, it will be horrifying. Probably around another million of people maimed and, you know, just disabled completely. Country reduced from 52 million in 1991 to different estimates between 19 to 22 million now, and half of the country essentially basically ran away. So, and we have a complete demoralization with the sum uh, you know, um, uh, sports of the Nazi battalions or brigades. Other than that, it's completely demoralized force. And now when this happens, Russians, you know, and I obviously have my real good justified reasons to uh, hate or uh, abhor the Western media class, uh, we have this situation which might be actually true. And this is really funny uh, because uh, Reuters, uh, reports two days ago or three days ago yeah three days ago that exclusive Iran brokering talks to send advanced Russian missiles to Yemen's Houthis sources say it was in September 24 as you can see yourself and let me make very important thing I am somewhat speculating and you have to keep in mind that you cannot quote me on this issue but one of those rare, rare cases when actually the Western media might have a case. Oh, there is always the fire where there is a smoke. And you know how Russians reacted to all this, you know, bravado from the West. They say, okay, it takes two to tango. And we will do the same. We will provide a really painful life for all military assets or other, uh, you know, commercial assets for the combined West if it comes down to. And guess what? Houthis are really good and here is what Reuters continue to describe and they talk about the um they talk about the p800 they call they mentioned here that uh, uh seven sources said that russia has yet to decide to transfer the yahunt missiles also known as p800 onyx well the, there is a not quite the same missile p800 is a uh, onyx which ranges standard is about 800 kilometers the latest uh, variations are 1000 kilometers but the yahunt missile is the what is called mtcr missile it's because it's range is only 300 kilometers so but onyx which experts say will allow the militant groups to more accurately strike commercial vessels in the red sea and increase the threat to the u.s and european warships defending them they are absolutely correct on this and here what is most important about this here is the new Strashimi class uh, escort ship. It's 11, pro Project 1154. There are only two of them, new Strashimi and much newer Yaroslav Mudra. Yaroslav Mudra is much more advanced ship. It carries the uh, anti-shipping missiles, but new Strashimi also went through some uh, degree of update and it carries a decent artillery, a, a, a decent anti-submarine warfare suit in Sweden, including obviously the anti-submarine helicopter. It has the 
the uh, decent uh, uh, short range air defense, which is of course Kinjal, which is not to be mistaken with the, uh, mistaken with the hypersonic weapon, but it is uh, basically nebulized version of Tor, so it has some capabilities, and it is precisely what it's designed to do thing uh, for. It's to be a escort ship, and that's where the interesting thing comes from. Some people they <coughs> report on August 18th that there was the Russian frigate New Strashimi, uh, uh, board number or you know, uh, seven one two straight of Gibraltar, uh, passing eastbound on August 18th. At eastbound means obviously in, in into the Mediterranean Sea, and then there was this thing. And that thing was also academic passion, which is called medium sea tanker, of uh, which also visited, <coughs> uh, um, um, for example, Cuba recently and uh, uh, countries of the Caribbean basin. But look at this. While it isn't primarily oiler, look what it has. The vessel is a medium-sized sea tanker, but apart from the oil and fuel tanks, it has a cargo hold in the middle part. That means cargo hold for all kinds of other cargos, and this is not. These are not tanks for uh, obviously oil or fuel, what have you. Well, uh, they are large enough to put in some significant equipment into them, and this is where we come to this issue, which is very interesting. Those two ships, those two ships, they met each other. And then, you know, in the Red Sea, essentially. And Neustrashimi, well, escorted this uh, academic passion to al Hodeida port, where it was unloading who knows what. And here I uh, show you something, which is the range, which I voluntarily, just simply random point in the <coughs> Yemen's uh, boonies, so to speak. I said, okay, if you place it somewhere in the middle of the mountains there, uh, here is what how the range of 800 kilometers of the standard P800 Onyx will look like. You see? So that is uh, okay. You can move those things, uh, you know, this thingy, uh, left, right, south, north, what have you. And it basically covers all the theater of operations of the Prosperity Guardian, which already failed anyway. But this time it becomes a real serious threat because Onyx, unlike the cottage industry and obsolete weapons which Hutches were using, uh, this is a completely different story. And it's, it, I mean, terrifying weapons system. It is Mach 2.5 between 2.5 2.9 missile system and yeah so good luck trying to intercept it. And while I <coughs> concentrated on the MTCR and uh, this is missile technology control regime and this is US State Department which has the you know basically rundown about what it is. The missile technology control regime is an informal political understanding among states that seek to limit uh, <coughs> proliferation of missile and missile technology. So what are they talking about? It started in 1992 where there are many uh, countries, including Russia, who said, you know what, yeah, we want not to proliferate weapons with a range longer than 300 kilometers around the world. But as you know, uh, by the way, on Trump uh, and obviously Bush and other administrations, United States abrogated every single treaty, forget about the regime, with Russia, from ABM to INAP to what have you. Now Russia said, you know what, we don't care about, uh, for example, START Treaty, we're not going to be signing it. And then, of course, MTCR, as is explained by State Department, here is the answer. No, is the MTCR a treaty? No, the MTCR is not a treaty and does not impose any legally binding obligations on partners. Aha! So, I can quit it anytime I want. And I have new, uh, basically, well, I speculate, but I have sense, if you wish, that Russia doesn't care anymore about those ranges of 300 kilometers, albeit it might still provide expert versions of uh, Yahunt, which is Onyx, uh, uh, with 300 uh, kilometer range. But look at this. The regime places particular focus on rockets and unmanned aerial vehicles capable of delivering payload of at least 500 kilograms to a range of at least 300 kilometers and on equipment, software and technology for such systems. And here comes this issue. Did Russia already quit this uh, regime because, yeah, it's not legally binding? 
uh, make your own uh, conclusions because obviously this uh, you know, rendezvous between Yustrashimi and academic passion and suddenly <laughs> ending up at Alcott Data port. Well, that makes you think, right? And obviously, why wouldn't Russia now do and make life of all kinds of the assets of the combined West miserable? You know what? Houthis or whoever they will be called, you know, they will be called Houthis. Whoever will pass for Houthis, we don't know who they will be. They certainly can make sure that some, or not just commercial uh, uh, traffic, but even military traffic gets hit by Onyx. And that is the missile which can sink a cruiser. So what can I say? Make your own conclusion. But this is what I had for you today, guys. And again, listen, it was absolutely hectic. Uh, the problem, of course, uh, with this video software, I hope it works. But anyway, so uh, as usual, those who like what I do, please subscribe to my channel. And those who can afford, please support me on the Patreon or buy me a coffee on too. And what can I say? Have a nice weekend and I'll talk to you later, guys. Bye-bye.